Hey guys, welcome back. So we are in the plant room hanging out yet again. Full disclosure, I am feeling a little bit of that holiday creative slump. I have a huge long list of like more topic based videos just in the queue the cue of my mind. I just don't have the energy, the mental energy to, to t take that on just yet. I think give me another week or so, I'll get back into the swing of things. But one thing that never changes is my love of being in this freaking plant room. This is truly my happy place. So I think this video, we can make a bit of a day of it. We can do a little bit of everything. I have um, new plants I want to show you. I think I have four four new plants to show you. They are, they're very exciting ones. And I have um, a few like growth updates, new leaves I wanna show you, kind of like notable new things. And then um, while we do so, I wanna go through like my anthuriums and kind of assess who I'm trying to get big, either just to have the satisfaction of having a really big plant or even just to get it to flower so I can breed them. And then there's some that like, I don't really have that much interest in breeding. So those are the ones I'm thinking maybe we can take downstairs and chop up. And other ones I might want to kind of gather in the same bin for repotting because like I said so many times over the last few months, I'm trying to get on top of like repotting very regularly, just upsizing those pots constantly so that the plants can get bigger much quicker. I think for myself, I'm a bit of a firm believer in that method, but I wanna keep doing it just so it continues to prove itself to me as the way to quickly size up anthurium. So we'll be here for the first half of the video and then we're gonna head downstairs and do some repotting and that will be the video. So the first thing I wanna show you are the new plants that I got last week. So bit of a backstory. My friend Jose, I've mentioned him a few times, but just to catch you up, just in case this is the first time you've heard his name, this is his handle on Instagram and he is sadly, like I'm actually so, so, so terribly sad about this. He is moving to Australia, I think in about a month or so. He has an insane plant collection. So last week, or like for the last few weeks, he's been selling off his collection because his goal is to sell his entire collection. He's not bringing anything with him to Australia. It's just way too hard of a process. So he sold a bunch of them privately to friends and things like that. And then last week at Northwood Tropicals, we had a live sale and there was like a big chunk of it that was just Jose's plants. So he sold a lot of it through Lauren. There will be another live sale, um, I think, by the time this video goes out, it will be this coming Friday. So the week of this, the, fri the Friday of this week, there will be Jose round two. And that's gonna be like little tiny babies and stuff. I think his biggest ticket items already sold. But anyway, prior to the live sale, I purchased two plants from him. One of them is joint custody with Charmaine. So we went in on this plant together and we co-own this plant. Let me show you first the little baby plant I bought. This is my new baby, Carla Blackie. This originally came from Woohoo Tropicals. I wanted this for a couple reasons, several reasons. I freaking love Carla's. They're, I don't know, like they do something for me that very few anthuriums can do. And I have been having the time of my life growing my Carla. Let me show it to you really quick. Honestly, any chance I can get to show my plant, I will show it. So this was my original Carla. This one, if you're familiar at all with Woohoo Tropicals and the way they name their plants, they have, I believe, two Carlas that they're breeding with. I don't know if they have any more than that, but this is Woo One Self. So Woo One is like a Carla they have that is slightly more narrow and the, the baby really does kind of take on that narrowness. Although in saying that, most things in my tent kind of grow narrow anyways, even if they're not kind of like predisposed to being narrow in form. This one from Jose is Wu Tu Self. So Wu Tu is their more round, kind of wider Carla. And so of course, I feel like I need both. He got this as a little baby, so I want to say, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was just those two little leaves at the bottom. This one is just so freaking cute. The veins are so thick and it's quite round compared to mine was around that age. I guess the closest leaf I have would be this one. This one's a lot more of a heart shape. So I wanted this plant so badly because I was having such an easy time with that Carla and it grew faster and it sized up faster, like way beyond my wildest dreams. 
because when I first got it, it was this leaf was the biggest one. So we're pretty much there now with this leaf. So I'm thinking of it like it took it, what felt like no time. It took three months to get to this size. I'm thinking that or hoping that I can do the same with this one. And I have friends that have Carla's and stuff, but I would like to be able to breed pure Carla's with these two. So it'd be much easier for me to do that. By the time I am able to do so, I am 100% sure the Carla craze will die down, but that doesn't matter because I will always love Carla. It's just one of my favorite anthuriums of all time. My hope is that I can get both of them to flowering size within the next year. By then, the anthurium craze probably won't be here anymore, but I just know in my heart, I will always be an anthurium girl. So that was the thought behind this. It is potted in a mix of tree fern and lechuza pond, like straight lechuza pond, but it looks like it's very heavy on the pond because if you look at the top, look at all that pond to show you on the side there as well. I think I am going to repot it into the next size up square pot. I was gonna grab one to show you, but too lazy. The next size up and then I'm gonna put it in tree fern soil. That's what I have this one growing in. So this was like half aeroid mix, half tree fern. This one also needs a repot because look at those roots and they're all escaping at the bottom. So these two are gonna go into the repot bin. Okay, and now for the the joint one with Charmaine. I need to preface this by saying that like, Jose decided to move to Australia while he was visiting Australia. He was there on holiday. And while he was there, he decided that it was definitely happening that they were moving to Australia. So as it relates to the plants, it was bad timing because he was away for three weeks. And the way he grows all his anthuriums, or not all, but the majority of his anthuriums are in a grow tent, but in straight lechuza pond, like nothing added to make it chunky or anything. And he treats the chews upon like soil. So he doesn't keep like a reservoir on it, maybe like a little bit sometimes, but not like intentionally keeping a reservoir on it. So the plants dry out really fast. And Anna who works at the shop was going there once a week to water, but there was one week where she couldn't make it because there was like a weird situation with the locks and stuff. So all his plants missed one watering and that ended up with kind of sad anthuriums or like some sad leaves where the plant was otherwise really happy. I knew all that going in. I saw all the, you know, drought damage, the, the, the sadness, and I bought it knowing that. So here, oh my gosh, it's in a saucer with a bunch of water. So I really hope I don't spill it all over myself. This is me and Charmaine's new Papillolamnum Fort Sherman Ralph Lynam. <laughs> I'm showing you the newest leaf because it's like the prettiest. It's the one that's not yellowing or anything. A lot of the leaves are yellowing um, and they're starting to go. This leaf was emerged while he was gone, but then um, it didn't get watered enough. So it kind of like hardened this way, didn't fully form. And then this one, I think probably emerged like near to the end of when he was coming back and it was growing, but it didn't size up that much. But I'm gonna just pop a photo here of what it looked like just a couple of months ago before before the unwatering thing happened. So yeah, this, this is basically what I think of or what I've always thought of up until, up until Amanda came along really when I thought of Papillolamnum. I thought of those like really tall ears, the really dark velvety texture and the really long, just elongated, very sharp looking leaf. And also that very like vertical looking venation that just comes almost like straight down. So I'm so thrilled to have this. Like Charmaine and I were both looking at the pictures and we're just like knowing in our hearts that we don't really have the funds to be purchasing a plant like this. But at the same time, like we saw the potential in it and as like a co-owned thing like we're each paying half it doesn't hurt as much and the nice thing is it's already flowering so this is like the third flower so it's ready to take a breeding in theory but because like a lot of the leaves are yellowing off i am going to wait until it grows a couple more leaves and just has a little bit more leaf to support itself before i put anything onto it so i'll definitely harvest the pollen from this and using it on something else i just don't know what just yet it is taking all of my willpower not to chop these yellow leaves off. I just wanted to be able to reabsorb those nutrients as much as possible because I want this plant to be big and strong, but like everything else, um, it's in pure lechuza pond. 
I'm keeping a reservoir on it. I have it in this like dollar store drawer organizer thing. Even though this plant is um, used to kind of drying out a little bit, I don't like to do that with my anthuriums. I've seen far too much like drought damage on my anthuriums in the past. I just don't want to repeat that and I'd far rather the plant get used to having a little bit of wetness at the bottom than to accidentally dry it out and lose a whole bunch of roots that way. I don't really even see roots down here anyway so I don't even think any roots are sitting in water. I just wanted to get used to having constant moisture in there. But as far as this one goes, I don't think it needs repot just yet. I'm going to just like leave it like this. This is so awkward to hold you guys. Um, yeah, so like I said, this is going to be a shared thing with me and Charmaine. I think we'll breed it at least once, maybe twice before we chop it and share it. Like, or like I chop it and like let her grow her plant from this. One thing he did tell me was that he used to have this in like aerobic mix, like a soil mix and it rotted all its roots. When he put it into Lechuza pond, it started to root, it started to grow leaves, and then it started to flower. So he was like, it's pond. Like that's that's gonna be the substrate for it. So I think if I repot it sometime in the next couple of months, I will put it into like pond, but I feel a little bit more comfortable with my pond mix. So my pond mix has usually, at the very least, coarse perlite and orchiata. I think this mix works well for me, especially in no drainage, because I don't know if you ever noticed, um, if you <laughs> use Lechuza Pond a lot, or even Lekka sometimes, the smell on that when you unpot it, not always, but if there's any sort of rot in there, it is so foul. Like, there's very few smells that you come across on the day-to-day -day that smells as bad as, like, Roddy Lechuza Pond, Roddy Lekka. I recently had the displeasure of um, unpotting a plant I was trying to root in Lekka and I took it out and the smell hit me. It was like, if you ever worked in a restaurant when they were emptying out the grease trap, like grease trap is what like catches the grease from the dishes and stuff so it doesn't go into the water line. That, it smelled like that <laughs> and it smells like vomit. But then when I was like washing it with hot water, I was rinsing it and rinsing it and rinsing it with like really boiling hot water. I was like boiling water, pouring it over top. It started to smell like mothballs. Another very unpleasant smell. So my theory, because I don't really um, encounter that smell very often with my pond plants, my theory is that because I add organic media in there in the form of orchiata, it kind of helps the bacteria. Is something for the bacteria to feed on? I don't know but my pond plants don't really smell when I unpot it. So to make a long story short, this plant, if I'm going to repot it, whether it's in drainage or no drainage, I'm going to put it into my pond mix. The added perlite really is to add more like chunk to it, to have a little bit more space because purely shoes upon is so freaking dense. This is really, really heavy. My arm is on fire holding this up. It's super heavy and for anthurium roots, personally, I know it works for people. I know people swear by pure lechuza pond for anthuriums, but personally, I think those roots, because they're so thick, I want to give them a little bit more space to kind of extend through the substrate. And the perlite definitely does that, but it makes the overall substrate dry out slightly faster. So all in all with the pond is really just like cataloging in your mind how quickly these things dry out and like how the different substrates and amendments will change like watering cycles and things like that. Oh my gosh, this is so freaking heavy. So yeah, meet our new baby. <laughs> kind of surreal to be holding this plant right now. Oh, before I forget, this is um, originally from Grant. I had a little peek of his Instagram and I want to say that he bred the Fort Sherman to the Ralph Lynham and made these babies. Actually, I'll pop a photo in of what it looked like when Jose first got it. And I want to say it's probably been less than a year or around a year. Okay, I'm going to put this down now because it's so freaking heavy and it's dribbling on me. Oh my gosh, speak of the devil. He just sent me his plant list part two. There's so many things on here that I am interested in. I said that the purchase of those plants already wiped me out, but... If they're seedlings, maybe I can get a couple more. <laughs> okay, couple more that I got from Charmaine. I'm so, I'm so excited to have this one. Okay, this one I have shown in a previous video because I got it for her. I bought a couple of plants from Amanda for her birthday in October. And one of them was a Forgetii Carla. 
It is beautiful. It looks like half forgetty eye, half Carla. It's a forgetty eye, like kind of few sinus, super dark with Carla venation. And it has a really beautiful pebbly leather texture. I, I have to show you, this is another one from the same seed batch, but not the same plant from Justin created in gardens. Like no, it's not his hybrid, but he owns this plant. And oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. It was a little, it was a little painful handing that plant off to her, but I was also so freaking excited for her to have it because like, I love giving presents. And when it's a present like that, it just made me feel so good. So it was equal parts, like really happy and kind of wistful at the same time, but she chopped it and she gave me a little butt cut of it. And I mean, it's not, not really anything to see right now, but I am so, so excited to have this now. Um, it's in a little dessert cup with a little lid. It's in tree fern. I think there's soil in here. There might be soil or it might just be tree fern. It's hard to tell these little particles. It's hard to tell if that's tree fern dust or soil dust. But um, yeah, this one is sitting in a tray under grow lights. It's domed and I cannot wait for it to grow. The other plant I technically already own, but I don't have her specimen. So this one is red crystal port. I think it's also in tree, it might be tree fern soil. I didn't ask. So, I mean, it's just a tiny little offset that she separated from her mother plant. So I have this plant, but mine is a different specimen. It's from the same seed batch from Amanda, but hers just looks a little bit, I want to say it just looks different. So it definitely has like a bluer tone to it. Um, I'm hoping that I have been able to find a picture of hers. It's like a little bit more of a textured leaf surface. It's more of that like grainy pebbliness. And it has a very, like, not a close sinus, but really close lobes. I'm just gonna grab mine really quick so I can show you them side by side so you know why I wanted a piece of hers. Okay, don't get me wrong, I really like mine as well, but it just has a different kind of texture and overall leaf shape. I just find hers just a little bit more handsome, and I definitely didn't need it. I wasn't like, please cut it for me or anything, but hers produce offsets like left, right, and center. So she had a whole bunch of them going and she asked if I wanted one. It's just really hard for me to kind of put into words why hers is nicer. I definitely know that one huge difference is like the overall leaf texture. Mine has a little bit of that graininess, but hers are like really nice, tight little grains. And it's like a really even uniform texture. I think hers slightly has a more blue tone. I think I already said that. And I think her lobes are slightly more like wide and rounded. So mine are slightly narrower and there's a little bit more space in between. I think that's how I see hers in my mind. And hers, I think, has more of a, that classic like love heart shape. Mine's a little bit more elongated. So what I will do is um, I'm now that I'm holding this plant, I kind of want to chop it. I think I want to chop it and see if I can get a piece back. And if she decides she doesn't want it, then I will sell it. But she has some time to decide whether or not she wants a piece of this one or not. Even if I don't chop it, this one is kind of needing a rearranging at the very least or a repot into a bigger pot. So yeah, those are my four new plants that I'm very, very excited about. Okay, I wanted to show you this plant before it fully hardens because the leaf is crazy. This is, oh, actually freaking, oh my gosh, the roots. I did not know it was like this inside the pot. Okay, well, I guess you're getting repot. No, you're not. You're still really floppy. Mmm, repot or not? Mmm, no, I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait a week or so. This is, it looks so freaking weird in the viewfinder. This is my red crystallinum no yes red crystallinum cross with luxurians from woohoo tropicals so the last leaf i was so enamored with because it's like such a tight pebbly like a very smooth yet pebbly leaf texture and it was so dark and beautiful it was like a holographic purpley color and it was also like a nice jump up in size from this leaf to this one <laughs> this leaf it's so weird look at that 
texture. It's got the smooth pebble and then it just has all these huge like blisters. It reminds me of like naan or like any sort of bread that blisters and chars like Neapolitan pizza, especially with that like brownish color and then how those really big warty bumps look really dark. Like it really does look like it got charred in the oven. It's so crazy, but I love it. It's so weird. It's so freaking weird. I am so in shock over these roots because I guess, I guess I wasn't really picking this plant up very much. This is, I guess, about three months of root growth in tree fern soil, I forgot to say. It has uh, like at the bottom. Should I repot it? I really don't want to sacrifice that leaf size because I do think that, I'm just watering it right now. Um, I do think it will continue ex to expand, but it won't expand to its full potential if I repot it today. So I'm going to wait for it to expand a little bit more, give it another week or so. Oh, I put a lot of water in there. By the way, in case anyone's wondering, today we are watering with just straight up TPS1 fertilizer. Okay, this plant, I definitely want to repot. Nothing like too much to say about it. This is Vagilux or what Lauren calls Crystal Mag cross with Forgetti Eye cross with Luxurians. This has been living in this like plastic cup for a while with no drainage. It just has filled it completely with roots. It's starting to drop more of the low, lower leaves. And I just know that it's not going to upsize anymore in this pot. So it definitely needs something bigger. And I don't think I need to grow it in my tent anymore. So I will uh, probably either put it on like this shelf here or somewhere in my living room. This could definitely do well in ambient conditions. This newest leaf is almost fully hardened and it's probably the same size or even a bit smaller than this leaf. And the reason why it's called Vag, or like the, the mother plant was called Vag, if you've been in any of the NST live sales, you will have heard the story before, but the mother plant, one leaf had this like fused, it was like half fused in the back and it had these like lobes, <laughs> lobes, labia that came out the back. Anna at the shop just nicknamed the plant Vag and then we... <laughs> I forget who it was. It might have been me or Lauren let slip in one of the live sales that it was called Vag and then it stuck and now everyone knows what we're referring to when we say Vag Lux. This Crystal Mag Forgetti Eye is just like, it's a guess at best because it's not definitely that order. So it's much easier to call it Vag Lux and also, um, what's it called? Crystal Mag Forgetti Eye doesn't really tell the story of what that plant looks like. Because if that plant is very, very silvery, it has Crystal Hope vibes. Anyways, this will go in the bin. Small little update on my little green form Ace of Spades offset. It really is dying off this leaf. And it's not looking like it's trying to push out another. Like looking at the petiole of it, it does not look like it's trying to do anything there. However, it has rooted a whole bunch. There's some here at the back as well. Ugh, this was the plant that I wanted to give to Charmaine. And I guess trade, in a sense, for those plants that she gave me. And I say trade, like, super loosely. Me and Charmaine don't really trade. We just hand each other plants. And then at some point we get some back. It's a very <laughs> free-flowing, unplanned. It's not a transaction whatsoever. But in theory... Um, when she said she was going to give me this like forget it, Carla and this like red crystal port I said I was going to chop uh, or I said I was going to give her this green form ace which I know she's been eyeing for a while I just am so confused what it's trying to do I'm trying to see if it's like activated another growth point which it actually might have it's going to be really hard to show you but I think there might be something poking up below this leaf I am so unsure of this plant. It's not an easy anthurium. I actually find the dark form easier, but also at the same time, I don't think either of them are super easy. So this one is definitely not doing the best. Another plant I might chop for Charmaine. I'm trying to decide if it's going to be this one or my other BVEP. This is my BVEP from Amanda that was bred by Grant. This one is in straight tree fern with uh, perline pond added. And it's not that rooty, 
Um, but I remember when Amanda sent me this plant, it was like, it was a big stem. So I feel like both of them could be chopped. This one actually has over time gotten quite a bit darker. I was actually pretty surprised. I thought this wasn't going to be a very dark one, but it has really nice like puffy pillowy venation. The other one I repotted a few weeks ago. Oh, there's roots. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> okay. So this one I was really kind of nervous for. I went from tree fern in no drainage to tree fern soil in drainage and it has since pushed out a new leaf and I, oh, the one root I saw is right at the top of the pot, but there's another one here actually. Yeah, I, I repotted it because it wasn't rooting like crazy and this was happening on the leaves. And I was like, is it, is it the no drainage? Is it getting burned by fertilizer that has nowhere else to go? Cause this was also happening, but I've also been kind of observing on other people's BVAPs on Instagram. Sometimes they'll have like, like a BVAP or two in the background of a photo. And it's not the focal point of the photo, but I can see it. And I'm noticing that a lot of BVAPs seem to have this kind of issue. I don't, I don't know what it is. Like to me, I thought this was fertilizer burn. And that's why I moved it to, to drainage and um, to tree fern soil. But the ones I'm seeing are in drainage and um, they're with anthurium growers and collectors that I feel like are probably more experienced and better at growing anthuriums than I am. So I am still trying to figure out what this is, but I could also chop this for her. I just want it to root more. I don't think it's going to root any more out like the bottom part of the stem. So when I do chop it for her, it might just have a couple of root nubbins and just a chonk, um, definitely no leaves. Or I could chop the other one, the one that was from Grant. This one is also from Amanda, but it's um, from Paul, Paul Marcellini or Understory Oasis. So those are the two options for BVEPs that I would trade for the Forgetti Icarla, trade for the Forgetti Icarla. And then the green ace would be for the red crystal port. This is a plant that needs repotting. Um, it's in like the shallowest amount of substrate. This is one of my Topo Getty eyes. This leaf actually expanded a lot more than I thought it would. It was expanding really slowly. So I thought it was going to harden off somewhere around this size or like smaller, but it got bigger. It's in one of my little, like little round yogurt cups with like so little substrate. So when I potted this, it was probably like leaves about this size. So I'll put this in the bin as well. Another one I need to get like treated and stuff is this, what I call nearly dark forgetty eye. So mom is my forgetty eye that I thought it was a true dark forgetty eye with no silver. Um, but later started to show like pinstripe silver. And the dad is a true like straight, straight dark form, no silver forgetty eye. So the offspring has just like tiny amounts of silver, quite bullate. Um, this one is getting eaten by spider mites and you can see on the leaf, there's all these speckles and it's also double headed. So there's two plants in here that I want to separate out and I just want to get it out of this pond so I can get it like soaked up and stuff. Cause I'm trying to experiment with ways to not like fully kill the leaf by treating for spider mites. And I feel like, like a light soapy solution and getting it really, really rinsed is the only way I can preserve, <laughs> preserve a leaf like this. Cause once I separate these little plantlets off, um, this will be the only leaf to support itself. Um, and without putting it under a dome as like a, like a leafless chunk. So that's the plan for this. I'm just going to separate out these two plants. And I think one of these will go to Jing. Um, and one of these will be kind of, grown more, make sure there's no spider mites and, um, and sell. And I'm not even going to give the one to Jing to Jing anytime soon, because I know Jing is not dealing with spider mites. I do not want to be responsible for introducing spider mites to her home. So yeah, it's going to be a little while, but I'm going to separate these two, treat it, and then keep them isolated from other plants. So this is the mom of that forgetty eye. It also got hit with spider mites. I am so upset my dark forgetty eye that's next to it also has 
speckly stuff on it. But luckily, Lauren um, ordered in more speckle ulti mites. So this is the Californicus mites. I forget the full Latin name, but I will link these ones in the description. These are supposed to be good for ambient conditions. They don't need like high humidity and super warm in order to activate. So I did wipe down a lot of these plants with uh, spider mite knockout before applying these sachets. I brought 30 of these home, I think it was last Friday, so today's Monday, so I just kept them in a cup inside of my tent for the mites to wake up. They're shipped cold, so they stay dormant inside of these little packets, so I wanted to warm them up so they would start waking up and coming out of the little, the little hole. There's like a little hole here that they come out, and other mites come out too, so they are packed with these like feeder mites, I think. I'm pretty sure. I know they pack with feeder mites for the Thripex, like the ones that target thrips. I'm pretty sure there are little feeder mites in there just so the predatory mites have something to eat. But I've spread out these little packets everywhere. This is how I've chosen to um, apply them rather than hang them on the petiole, even though it's super ugly. But I want to make sure that they come out right onto the leaf blade. I didn't have enough for everything. I just targeted the ones that either I think are spider mite magnets, like the velvety ones, or ones that would be more sad to get spider mite damage on. So I have some of them here <laughs> on my queen of hearts. By the way, my queen of hearts, in case anyone was wondering, so it was flowering and queen of hearts is notoriously difficult to breed. Some even call it sterile, but I know that some people have successfully bred this. One quick update on it is that this inflow was receptive for a really long time and it actually never produced pollen, but it did push a second inflow. So we'll see if this even produces pollen and it's also working on another leaf. Little update on my Mag Ace, my Magnificum cross with Ace of Spades. This leaf did dry out quite a bit from Spider Mite Knockout. Um, it is still expanding. It's really sad to think about how big this leaf would be if it didn't get hit with spider mites and I didn't have to treat it. But it's like still super, super soft, really, really like papery. And it's like that much bigger than the rest of the leaves. But knowing that there's spider mites in here, there's evidence of it, I put one on every plant. And then in here, I think I just put a couple. So my Alocasia Watsoniana, this one was responsible for attracting spider mites in the first place in this exo and this magnificum hybrid from amanda this really beautiful beautiful one that i was so sad to find spider mites on but yeah everything in this exo got wiped down before i put the mites on oh really quick this orchid i don't know the name of is flowering it has the most evil looking flower i'm pretty sure if i remember correctly it's going to be like a reddish orange like really small but like bat-like flower. I'm really excited to see that come out. I have never ever had an orchid flower for me. No, that's not true. I had a jewel orchid that would flower, but those flowers aren't very pretty. They're like, they're to me the equivalent of begonia flowers, just like small, cute, but nothing like show-stopping like a lot of orchids. So I'm really excited to see that one come out. I forgot to mention my dark forgetty eye, this guy, this is the one that I'm waiting to produce pollen off of this inflow so I could breed it to tofu again because tofu, I've mentioned in a past video, I have tofu as a house guest right now because we're going to breed the two again. The other inflow on this plant was producing berries. This plant had another inflow before that already pollinated. So I had put bastard pollen on it. Bastard is a plant from Amanda. This is bastard. Um, Bastard always has this like overlap, not overlapping, this like, what do you call this? Lobes that, that <laughs> stick together like this. They all do that. And it has like a very cute womanly kind of shape. Literally every leaf does that. Um, she thinks it's like a Magnificum Forgettii hybrid of some sort. So this plant is kind of strange because Lauren also has it and she's tried to breed Bastard and bastard never takes anything like nothing has been successful on bastard before i knew that about bastard i had put bastard pollen on the dark forgetty eye and it was definitely successful but now the infructescence is dying inexplicably i don't think that the plant is stressed other than that this leaf got slightly attacked by spider mites but overall the plant is doing okay it's definitely been worse I just don't know why it's aborting this one. I'm just, this berry looks like it's going to fall off. Um, 
no, it's hanging on actually. And there's a couple that are like kind of greenish. I was pretty excited to see what that one would look like, but this one looks like it's dying. So as berries fall off, I'm just going to put them in water and just like plant them in tree fern and see what happens. But I'm pretty sure none of the seeds are going to be viable. Um, so that's sad. <laughs> okay, very small change of plans. The repotting that we're going to do with all these plants. These ones here are going to take place tomorrow. I just got a message from my boyfriend that he's coming home. I cannot film in front of him. It's just, it's too uncomfortable. And also he's not really feeling well. So I think some peace and quiet is in order. This will literally make no difference to you because it's gonna cut right to next day, but I will obviously be wearing different clothes and looking different by tomorrow. So that will explain things, but we're gonna, we're gonna continue this off tomorrow in the kitchen. So it's two days later. Lauren sometimes reminds me that it's kind of a specialty of mine to say I'm gonna be back tomorrow and then not come back tomorrow. Yesterday was a little bit of a write-off. Yesterday was supposed to be the day that I filmed this and then today I was supposed to be at the shop with Charmaine doing plant chores, website restock, Instagram story sale, um, and I was supposed to be at the shop tomorrow as well. But then my boyfriend started feeling sick so I was messaging Charmaine like I don't know if we should carpool because he's sick, she's pregnant, she's immunocompromised and she was like I got my flu shot so as long as it's not COVID it's fine I don't mind it's COVID um so so we're isolating now I feel fine thank god I don't know how I'm still fine but I feel like I'm just on the brink of getting sick and I'm just trying my hardest to just stay hydrated I'm just chugging vitamin C zinc so um yesterday like I could have filmed but I was in just such a kind of bad mood after figuring that out. Not really a bad mood, but just like the mood was killed. I wasn't going to be able to film and I figured since I'm not going to be able to be at the shop, I'm going to film now, but um, I can't, I can't believe it. Four years, four years without COVID in this household and now in 2024, it happened. So the reason why we're in the plant room instead of the kitchen is because he's got the downstairs right now. I got my plant room where I can film in peace without anyone listening to me. So since it's been two days I'm like a little fuzzy on what plants I pulled last time but I do know I definitely want to repot my Carla's first just because I'm like the most antsy about them I think everyone is going into tree fern soil so I don't think I need any other substrate other than that and then I have my pots so this Carla my my bigger one is gonna go into just the next size up and it's good timing because She's just about to push another leaf right here. She's growing so fast. Little Carla will go into... Oh my gosh. Also the next size up. So she's in the small one. This is the medium one. I get asked so often where these pots are from. It's not like the only place to get it, but I get them from Lauren, Lauren um, North Shore Tropicals. And I always just like say these things off the cuff, but Typically, if, in case you're not aware, if if I uh, if I remember to, I don't always remember to, but if I mention someone, I will try to always link them in the description. But um, check the description box first if you're unsure who I'm talking about or like what I'm talking about. Usually, I'll try to remember products. Products, honestly, I will forget products. I will forget links for products a lot of the times because my videos are on the longer side. And I don't always remember everything that I like I touch, pick up, whatever, or like I don't even think about it when the plant is potted in something. Um, but yeah, check there. And if I don't have it listed in the products mentioned section of the description, then then let me know because I'll be able to add it in later after the fact. And I'm just realizing you cannot see anything. Let me move you down. If I had thought more in advance, I would have put like a question box on Instagram for you guys to submit some like topics for chatting about, but I didn't. So we're just gonna not chat that much. Maybe chat a little bit. There's no chance of me not breaking any roots at the bottom, but I'll try my best. Small amount of root breakage here. I don't need to remove all the roots. I just want to inspect the roots to make sure that everything is healthy. There is a little bit. I think I overwatered it slightly. 
I really hope you'll be able to see this, but this root here is slightly translucent on the tips, which means to me they're on their way to rotting. So I'm gonna just, um, let me see how far up it goes. I think I will just chop it like an inch up, but otherwise the roots seem all right. So it's gonna go into this pot. It's quite a small root system, but that's exactly the same thing as I did for this guy when I got it. And look how much it filled out that pot and it started to upsize pretty quickly straight off the jump because the first leaf was this and I was like, it looks a little silly right now, but I'm gonna trust the process of like potting it too big. And then the next leaf it gave me was this big. So I'm gonna try it again. Hopefully this Carla responds the same way. And then just to recap, this is the substrate we're using. So I have an aeroid mix, which is like bagged, um, like gardening potting soil. I add extra perlite to it. I add fir bark. And then I have my tree fern mix, which is like tree fern fiber mixed with perlite and lechuza pond. And I just mix the two. I wanna say it's like roughly 50-50, but you know, I don't really, I just go by feel. So when it's like as fluffy as I want it to be, then like I stop adding amendments, but it's not like the chunkiest. You can see it's like not like super large particles inside. I may have just bought another plant from Jose, even though I said I couldn't afford it anymore. Um, he doesn't need payment right away from me, certainly before he leaves uh, the country, but I hope to give him or pay him for this plant like next week. This time I won't tell you what it is until I show it to you, but I'm very excited. It's obviously an anthurium. Jose's collection is pretty much like 99% anthuriums. Also, um, I am planning, hopefully, hopefully in the month of February, maybe like in the first half of February. I can't make any promises. I want to film, finally, my entire Anthurium collection video. Because I was um, updating, I, I mentioned before, I had a spreadsheet that I shared with Lauren and Charmaine. It's a spreadsheet that lists every single anthurium that I have and whether it's flowering and whether it was pollinated and who it was pollinated to or by. This is for me to keep track, but also um, <laughs> Lauren and Charmaine haven't updated theirs yet, but the idea was for us to be able to look at each other's spreadsheets and figure out whether they have a flowering anthurium of whatever species or hybrid and kind of like see what we could match things up with. So I was just updating that the other day with like, I hadn't updated it for a couple of months now. And I just got a few plants in that time. So I wanted to make sure everything is in there. So in that spreadsheet, I can see how many plants I actually have. And it was actually less than I thought it would be. So I think, I think I now have around 75 anthuriums. I honestly thought it would be more. So one of the reasons why I put off like the entire collection video for so long is because it's such a big video. Like showing 75 plants in one video is going to be, oh, that's good. That's gonna be difficult. I probably will have to split it up into two parts, but I cannot believe I've been on YouTube now for two years and I haven't done that video yet. It's actually a little bit crazy especially considering it's my favorite genus. So this one's done. I'm gonna sit it in this deli cup and then in this watering can is great white water. I just mixed great white directly into the water and I'm going to water targeting the root ball. I'm not gonna worry about leaving much of a reservoir, just whatever drains out the bottom. Actually, I'm gonna make a tag for this really quick. These are the cutie, cutie little, um, clear plant tags you can't even see well i can't see it in the viewfinder um from Rosa tropicals i bought a refill of tape for my little bluetooth printer and i bought clear and i'm just realizing i think i prefer the white tape because clear on a clear plant tag would look really good but if i try to label directly on the pot like let's say i'm selling it or something you can't see it so if i were to buy it again i probably would just get clear no white, white tape. I'm out of the white tape though. 
Carla Black, yay, woo to self. Print. Oh, that's really small. <laughs> Whoops. I also have never done a full philodendron collection video, and that one would be a much easier undertaking than an entire anthurium collection video. This is done, by the way, because my philodendron collection is way smaller than my anthurium collection. Okay, next up is this one, which I am really nervous about because these roots that escape from the bottom are really thick. Gosh. Oh gosh. Please, please, please. Whoa, whoa. Did we do it? Did we do it? Come on, come on, come on, come on. No! Okay, well, we, we broke one, which is not that bad. This fatty little root tip, dang it. But not bad overall. I'm going to just remove this uh, leka at the bottom. I'll probably just like chuck it straight into the next pot because there's nothing really wrong with it. And the roots look great. No rot to trim off. This is as much as I'm loosening. I really only took that Lekka layer off. I mean, some little bits fell off, but I'm not touching any of the substrate here. I'm gonna just plant that into the bigger pot. Everybody seated, seat belts on. I'm also thinking, sorry, I keep jumping back and forth between topics. I'm also thinking for the next, or maybe for all of this year, I'm gonna try to do like more like random midweek uploads. Cause after doing it for Christmas, I'm just like, it's not that bad. It's not that bad doing two videos a week. If I do it every week, it more or less has to be my full-time job, which I just cannot afford for YouTube to be a full-time job just yet. But if I'm gonna do it every now and then without like any sort of expectation that it's every week, I can do like shorter videos. And by short, I mean like around 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minute videos. I'm feeling like I'm getting into like more of a groove with editing and stuff. And especially since I got my new computer in August when my old um, iMac died, it's been so much easier to edit, so much quicker to edit. My computer is like much more powerful now. So I'm thinking I could probably do more videos in a week and it's not just like a Christmas thing. Okay, Carla's done. <gasps> that was that was a little bit nerve wracking, but not as nerve wracking as it would be if I were chopping it. I said I was gonna reuse that Lekka and I didn't even reuse that Lekka. Okay, I'm gonna put her in this dollar store drawer organizer thing. I really hope I didn't mess up that new leaf that's emerging. I kind of doubt it. She's been such a good girl. And I made sure to like leave one of the newer roots, the active roots right on the edge so I can monitor how that keeps growing over the next few days. I'm gonna put her straight back in the tent because I cannot risk her getting sad. Maybe let's do the red crystal port now. I'm just gonna quickly put ugh, this Lekka into another pot because I'll definitely use this. And I'm just gonna gather some of this old substrate. Just in case you guys are wondering, I don't throw out tree fern soil if I think that it's not like full of like way too full of dead roots to even begin to separate out I'm gonna keep all of this and sanitize it in the oven so I do like 200 degrees also bearing in mind that my oven runs hot but I do 200 degrees for like 30 minutes um this one I might chop so it might end up going back into that pot because if I chop it the root system might be really small Okay, on second thought, this root system is its too much. I don't think I can chop it. Well, I can, but I don't have the mental energy today. So I'm going to just pot it up. 
So I guess it's gonna have to go into this big pot. So the upsize will have been like that. Not huge, but it lives in my tent and that's a pretty freaking big pot to go in my tent. I'm a little bit scared. Maybe this has to be kicked out. Honestly, I think I'm gonna have to kick it out. It's gonna go outside of my tent. Something that's kind of been on my mind lately is as plant people, right? Like you and I, I'm assuming most people watching this right now has somewhat of a plant collection. I mean, honestly, I would be really surprised if anyone was watching this that didn't own a plant. But if someone is watching this that doesn't have any plants, welcome. Um, but anyway, something that's been on my mind lately is just like how incredible our families or like our partners must be to live with us and our collections because plants really do take up so much of the home you know storage space and like if we have a tent or a greenhouse that takes up a lot of space i was thinking about this because like my friend jesse he just he relented and he just purchased a tent um he famously <laughs> Famously within our friend group, at least. I'm just reusing this soil, by the way. He famously grows the majority of his plants in ambient conditions. And he does so really, really well using mostly um, semi-hydro with LECA. And I'm actually quite surprised that it's taken him until now to get a tent because you guys know how much I love my grow tent and like, I don't think I could live without it. It's actually one of those plant supplies that... I am so glad that I got a tent in the first place and I don't think this hobby would be half as enjoyable for me if I didn't have that grow tent. So he recently got a grow tent and he was um, saying that it's just a small one, I think it's a 2 by 4 and he was saying how his partner didn't let him get what he really wanted which I think it was like a 10 by 10 by 8 or something huge, the kind that would take up an entire room in a house. And so the small grow tent is his compromise just so he has somewhere to keep his most precious plants. But it really reaffirmed in my mind just how incredible some of our partners are for just coexisting with our plants even though the majority of the people that I know with plant partners, their partners aren't plant people themselves. They are just like very understanding people that are super supportive of their partners and their hobbies and it just makes me feel so good knowing that there are people there that have that kind of supportive relationships because my boyfriend like bless him he is so so supportive of everything that I do with plants and even for YouTube he's the one that got this camera for me the one that I'm filming on right now and this room that I'm in my plant room is like a flex space I kind of just claimed it for my plant room. It's not like my room, but he just let me have it. It's on the, the top floor where all the bedrooms are. And it wasn't even like a thing. He was just like, yeah, this can be your plant room. And if I really wanted a plant and I couldn't get it, he would probably get it for me. Not that it has really ever come to that. And I think about this a lot, especially since I quit my job and he's the only one with a like a like a regular salary job right now. I work on contract with like consulting gigs, YouTube, and it's just this patchwork thing of things just so I can pay the bills. And he's the one really holding this house together while I kind of am pursuing my interests and my passions and my hobbies. And I see a lot of that mirrored in Charmaine, Charmaine's situation because Vince is the one who is um, a salaried full-time employee and I suppose like part of our love language is to create the best home possible for our partners so that they can enjoy the home without putting too much effort into it not to say that like I'm like a, some sort of housewife or anything this one is done by the way um I'm gonna find a saucer for it later and water it right now oh actually I do have this bin I will water it really quickly. I'll just set you aside. I'll probably put this one in my living room. I can't forget the tag. This is just like a random broken piece of tag, but it's Amanda's handwriting, so it's gotta stay. So it's not like our partners expect us to be like homebound and like it's our job 
to clean and cook and stuff like that, I would actually say the opposite. In fact, my boyfriend, when he learned, you know the term uh, girl dinner? So it's like when your partner is, is out maybe on a trip or like he's out for whatever reason for the day and you're home alone for dinner and you, you're just taking care of yourself for dinner. The idea is that like girl dinner is just like a handful of random just whatever, snacks, nuts, candy, um, a piece of cheese. Like it's just, you cannot be bothered making a proper meal for yourself, but you don't feel the pressure of making a proper meal because like you don't have anyone else to be feed for yourself. So like you might just make a smoothie or something. <laughs> he found the idea of girl dinners so offensive. Like he hates it. He's like, no, no girl dinners. Because he, he finds offense in the idea that I would ever feel like it was my responsibility to make sure that he was fed and that it's the woman's role to do that. So he's definitely not trying to, you know, pigeonhole me into being at home and being the one to take care of the house and stuff. But at the same time, I actually enjoy that kind of thing. I do enjoy cleaning. I enjoy cooking to some extent until I don't have any ideas and then it's kind of a chore. Or if I'm busy, it's like the last thing I want to do is cook dinner. But I do find that it works this way in a way because I don't, I don't work a classic job anymore. And I do remember when I was working a salary job, like Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of thing. I do remember how mentally exhausting it would be to come home and then still have to do that. Whereas now I get to work from home like 90% of the time and I am really happy to be able to do that. But I do feel like um, if the roles were reversed, I would feel a little bit of like, not, not resentment, not really not resentment. I feel, I would feel like I would also want to be able to be the one to work from home and like take care of the house rather than go out every day and like work my nine to five. And especially when like the, the working from home partner is able to do a lot of the things that they, it's essentially doing your hobby for a living for like, not, not full time for me, but you know, a, a bunch of the time. So I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for him for just being, that supportive person and I think that I can see that in a lot of my friends where they get to like buy plants meet up with friends plant friends I mean and do like plant events and they get to live out a hobby because I feel like very few people ever in this lifetime are able to find a hobby that they're so consumed by and gives back to them in such a way that I feel like the plant hobby does for a lot of us. I do think that we are so lucky that we were able to find something that feeds us in the way that that plants do. I mean, I certainly am mind blown that plants have become this part of my life where I cannot live without them. To the point where like when I was away on vacation, I missed my plants so much. I just wanted to see them and it wasn't enough just to see plants like if I went to see a garden center or I don't know if I went to a botanical garden it wouldn't feel that satisfying as if I were to be with my plants and touch them and like care for them and stuff and I hope if I'm not actively doing so already I would I would hope that I'm also giving back to my partner in some way that he knows how appreciated he is for supporting this hobby because I don't know what my life would be without plants, to be honest. I'd probably still be working a job that like really was eating me up from the inside. And I don't think I would be half as happy as I am now. Not to say that everything is rosy. I didn't even tell you what that plant was. It was my Topo Getty eye. It's not perfect and roses and butterflies and strawberries over here. It's coming up to uh, a year since I quit my job and decided to do coffee consulting full-time not full -time. well the idea was doing it full-time and then doing youtube on the side as it turns out it's more like half half at this point because consulting is kind of unreliable and youtube has actually been more reliable in a sense in the last year and um i'm coming up to a year there is some dead roots in here I'm pulling some roddy. Just a couple of tips actually, not too bad. I just probably overwatered this. This is in no drainage, so I'm not gonna mess with it too much. I'm just gonna pull what I see from the outside.
Yeah, so like I said, YouTube has been a little bit more consistent because I can rely on me <laughs> filming and upload a video um, once a week. Sometimes I miss a week for whatever reason. But actually, the only time I've missed a week since um, becoming self-employed was because my computer broke and I literally had no way to edit and upload a video. But yeah, I said when I when I started this that I was going to give myself two years to try to make things work and um, so far it is as scary as it has been when I knew I was going to be without um, stable income. I'm not going to lie, I am under so much stress trying to make ends meet which is even more more reason why i am so grateful for my boyfriend because he has stable income but i'm also really stressed out because the way that things are going right now is not going to be sustainable if it's going to be like that forever so i have like another year to try to make things work and try to stay out of the salaried rat race but if it has to be that i go back to it I will do it because I'm not going to stubbornly stick to something like that's just being able to do what I want to do and just not facing the reality of like the bills <laughs> and um, putting away money for the future and also considering that we're going to move to the UK at some point we need to be in independently like as individuals in really good financial situations in order to do that. I don't know if you guys know, and even I don't really know the full extent of it. I'm just like kind of hearing what people are saying about immigration to the UK. Um, there's a conservative government in office right now and they, let's just say, aren't that welcoming of immigrants. And that would be me. <laughs> so they're trying to pass some laws that make it so that whoever's immigrating has to be earning like already have a job in the UK that earns like a certain threshold and that I believe already exists but they're trying to make that threshold quite high not even just for myself but also for my boyfriend if he's going to sponsor me I or us together have to be earning a certain amount which is like not impossible but a daunting task considering that like my background is not a very high paying um, industry my background in cafe operations so unless we were to get like a corporate job with a big corporate coffee company it's not going to be easy to be earning what we need to be so yeah it's it's definitely daunting and I'm feeling a lot of the stress okay I think we have time for one or two more this one is going to be be hmm one's gonna be a bit messy so these are the two plants that I'm trying to separate these two growth points here I can probably cut it again to be honest I'm just gonna cut it here here so it doesn't leave much roots for the top but that's fine so there's a little little guy I can grow out and then these I think I'm gonna have to do one of these like vertical chops I do a vertical chop so like both sides I didn't even show you it was like this I just chopped it down the middle so both sides could have some roots I did chop it right down the middle of the stem like that and I'm just gonna really quickly rinse this in my sink I'm gonna just use Castile soap and rinse the new leaf and the old leaf and then we'll get it potted up but I'm gonna remove as much pond as I can because I don't want that going in down my drain. Okay, we're all clean. I never get to use these small pots. I think I'm gonna use this. Yeah, that'll be fine. It's kind of snug, but it's only two dingly dangly roots. By the way, I am not callousing this at all. I mentioned this in another video and I can't even remember if it was on my channel or if it was on Charmaine's channel. Um, I don't callous anthuriums anymore. I don't really even callus anything. I'm trying to think of the last time I cut a plant and calloused. No, I don't feel like I would callus anything anymore. And the reason for that is um, I know some people just never callus cuttings. And I used to do like the whole like dip it in cinnamon, dip it in sulfur, um, or like let it kind of harden off over the course of like a few hours. But I have two friends that don't callus at all. And those two people are Lauren <laughs> and Amanda and I trust that they know what they're doing so when I started working with Lauren I would help her propagate and stuff and I'd be callousing stuff and she'd be like don't bother so I'm like okay 
I'm not gonna callous it and I would pop things up and I'd see that they're fine and that was how I got over my fear of not callousing. Not saying that you shouldn't callous. Callousing plants certainly doesn't harm the plant unless you callous it for too long and it dries out and it becomes a lot harder for that plant to then bounce back but um for me personally I've come to see that um I'm okay with like the small risk but like the payoff is that I don't have to callous plants but there is always the risk that like root uh, stem rot I mean creeps into the stem um like at the open wound but honestly that's the risk that I'm taking and so far it's been working really well this one I'm trying to see maybe I just remove this leaf because it's going into a mm, no it can't go into the dome because it had spider mites no, I'll leave this on. I'll leave this on since it doesn't have to go into a dome. In other news, a little update on Doug. My my new puppy that we got in, I think it was, wait, when was it? September? Yeah, September. Um, Doug is now, well, he's just ticked past six months old and um, he's so cute, but so freaking annoying. <laughs> Some people, when I did the new puppy repot and I was talking about like how I had the puppy blues, when we got Doug, I just had this like existential crisis and I just got so sad and so depressed. Like I just had no energy and I was just like doom, a, like a sense of doom. And I was like re reading that that's like a really common thing to happen when people get puppies. There's like a lot of symptoms that overlap with postpartum and it tends to hit women harder than men. So anyway, um, <laughs> from that video, some people were like, yeah, I was thinking of getting a puppy, but now that I saw your experience, nope, no thank you. So we're kind of past the most difficult part of um, getting a puppy. Crazy potty training, getting up um, in the middle of the night to take them out to potty, taking them out every 20 minutes when they're playing, um, the biting, like the, you know, the puppy biting where they like really just like, like latch onto you. He definitely does still um, like chew on things that he shouldn't chew, but it honestly hasn't been as bad as, as um, Huxley was because Huxley was just a little bit more devious, whereas I feel like Doug wants to be a good boy more than Huxley ever did. Now Huxley's just like a good boy because he's used to it, but Huxley never wanted to be a good boy, I don't think. Doug, I feel like has been easier to train in some ways because he is trying to do the right thing and I just have to guide him to what is the right thing. But the annoying thing is that like Doug is still quite vocal. So all my friends who know Huxley know that he like doesn't bark, he doesn't really make much noise and it's the same with Rick, our, our English Bulldog. But then like Doug is still at that age because he's a, still a puppy, he's only six months old, where like whenever he feels something, he has to vocalize it. Like he has to like bark when he's happy, he has to bark when he's scared or startled, he has to bark or cry when he's like upset. And I guess like the annoying thing for me is that like I have to rewire my brain to either reinforce the things that I like or not reward the things that I don't like inadvertently. So like if he's barking, like he does this really annoying thing where like any bowls that are left down, like water bowls, food bowls, he has to flip them. And he knew because we made the, we made the um, mistake of like acknowledging it when he was flipping the bowls, like either trying to train him not to do it or like saying like, no, stop it. So he would get someone's like head turned towards him if he were to flip this bowl so he would do that like let's say we fed them and then me and my boyfriend went over to like where we eat dinner and they're away from us and Doug wants to see us and he'll start flipping the bowl over and over and over again and just like staring at me while he does it because he knows at this point that we don't like it and now I have to rewire myself to like not react at all I can't even turn my head and I need him to like get bored of it, I guess, and realize that like nothing good happens of flipping this bowl. But if he's really good and he sits there or like he's like playing nicely with Huxley or whatever, then heads do turn towards him and like he gets praise or he gets like fuss if he's doing the things that he at this point should know that is positive, like playing with toys, 
not chewing on my baseboards, my walls, flipping bowls. The annoying thing about the bowl thing, I can't leave a water bowl down because if he flips that bowl and I don't see it in time, I'm going to get water damage because I have hardwood floors and he's growing really well. So Huxley is the reason why our dogs are fed raw because when we got Huxley, we just fed him Royal Canaan kibble because that's what Rick our other dog always had with not Royal Canaan, but he was on kibble and Rick was fine. He it never seemed like overly excited to eat, but he didn't have like inflammation, allergies, like skin condition issues. But then Huxley, after being with us for like, I think it was like two months, three months, he started to get really itchy. So we were like, it must be a protein thing. So we got him off of chicken, which is what his kibble was. And then we switched him to, I think he was like fish or maybe pork or lamb but it was like this like low temperature cooked kibble still but it's not like the high 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 temperature kibble like it was cooked at low temperatures to try to preserve some nutrition but there's still a lot of starch and stuff in there and it just kept getting worse i was also feeding him like dehydrated raw as like a topper that didn't work he was getting so itchy like he had like mainly here and like in his chest he was scratching it so much that it was like raw and he smelled like a loaf of bread but like un undercooked so you could still smell the yeast he was just he was just like a hot loaf of bread super raw i was putting t-shirts on him so he wouldn't scratch his skin raw he was like so unhappy okay i finished all the plants but while i finish this story i'm gonna just repot my carla beef up it is pretty full of roots in this pot so we're gonna move it up to the next size so i basically fell down a rabbit hole of dog nutrition and then we came to the conclusion that we need to start feeding them like full raw so like completely uncooked not even dehydrated oh my gosh this mushroom <laughs> It is so cute, but also so phallic. Oh, no wonder it's sad. There's some root rot in here. I'm just gonna take all the substrate off and see what we're working with. So yeah, I fell down a rabbit hole and like I was just learning all this stuff that I never even gave a second thought to. So anyway, the dogs have been fed raw for five years now. And with Doug, we got him straight on to raw. Some people... I mean, it's it's controversial, I guess, in a way. Some people think that like it should be like a slow transition, but we went straight straight into it. He's been like 100% raw fed with very little starch in the form of like cookies and like he doesn't really get any food from from my plate. We don't feed Doug off our plate because we don't know what he will um, react poorly to, and. I am so glad not, well, so far, knock on wood, um, that we haven't had issues with Doug and allergies. There was a little point where we like bought some like, kind of like Christmas cookies kind of treats for the dogs and he was eating treats from that like cookie bag and oh my gosh, his ears were just full of wax. So as soon as he got off those like, those little biscuits it's actually not so bad this is the root system i don't really see much rot after that so I, I will still get it into the big pot like i was saying um when he got off of that his ears cleared up again um i'm just so glad to not have to go through that again because when huxley was dealing with allergies and like it actually took us probably a year a year and a half to get huxley like totally fine i do think that a lot of it had took a long time to leave his system to the point where I thought it was seasonal stuff because certain times of the year, like spring, summer, it would be worse and certain times of the year would be better. But now like he has not had a flare up in a couple of years, probably like three years now. Funny thing is like, I don't think many people know this, but like my, my other like passion that I feel like I could do for a living and be super happy doing, even if it's like a very simple life, and not making a lot of money but i could do dog food <laughs> for a living like i could work in a in a in a food shop some way for me to like nerd out about dog nutrition and i would be so happy so really rick 
and Doug have Huxley to thank that they're able to eat such stinky delicious food and it does cost a lot but I figure I'm saving that money in vet bills because the dogs really haven't had many issues again knock on wood um, since getting on raw I mean they haven't had illnesses and stuff we've had accidents where like someone broke a tooth on like uh, chewing on an, a thing they weren't supposed to be chewing on but other than that they haven't had like big issues so it honestly stresses me out wondering if they know that I'm doing my best to to keep them really happy give them a good life and I really hope that they are happy and I really hope that they they know how much they are loved oh my gosh it's getting so cheesy last plant is done hopefully it stops yellowing off leaves I really want to hold on to this leaf I want to get it darker this leaf has already started yellowing so that will probably go but this growth point has been kind of stuck for I want to say like two weeks now so hopefully this can jump start it I have a bad feeling that I said I was going to repot a plant and I didn't end up doing it but I can't figure out which one that might be so I guess I will figure that out when I go to edit this video but anyway I'm going to leave this here I have a plant room to clean up and a sickie to take care of downstairs so thank you for hanging out with me I hope you enjoyed this video have a lovely rest of the day and I'll see you in the next one